Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. I'm here today to talk to you about um, behavioral change models and theories that are commonly used in order to improve the exercise and health habits of your clients. A couple textbooks that I just want to point out, the American College of Sports Medicine or ACSM's Resources for the Exercise Physiologist, 2nd Edition, Chapter 11. Go ahead and scan this QR code here to see the textbook I'm talking about. And the other one is the American College of Sports Medicine's Guidelines for the Exercise Testing and Prescription uh, the 10th edition, and that's chapter 12 that you're going to want to look at in that. And again, you can scan this QR code to see the textbook I'm talking about. All right, so you're going to want to read those textbooks alongside with um, this lecture so that you can get a better understanding of the material. When looking again at the sequences for the exercise prescription tasks, um, we're looking at numbers 10 and 11 here. So you're going to be using behavioral change models and theories in order to help establish goals and prescribe exercise for your clients. And also you're going to use them um, in order to sort of keep your clients going over time. So they can even probably fall uh, under number 12 here, which is the scheduled periodic tests. The first theory that I want to talk about is the social cognitive theory for behavioral change. And it's basically the idea that your personal factors, so basically your personal traits, um, your behaviors, and your environments are going to all work together to determine your ability to uh, actually engage in, per, uh, in behavioral change and successfully change your behavior. All right, so these three things, um, we'll talk about each one individually now. So the personal factors, we're talking about the emotional state of the individual, um, their personality, their cognition, as well as their biology. So um, this also goes into their anatomy, their physiology, that sort of stuff. So basically anything that is biological or psychological about the individual is probably going to fall under the personal factors part of the social cognitive theory. The behavioral factors, now we're talking about um, their current behavior as well as their past behavior. So uh, for instance, if somebody um, has a past history of exercise, they're probably a little bit more likely to adopt exercise again because they still remember some of it. It's not quite as scary for them. They remember the, the pros and cons to exercise. And so for them, getting over the hump to exercising again is going to be easier than somebody who's never done it before. So obviously, um, that's going to affect their ability to have some sort of behavioral change, especially related to exercise or other health um, outcomes. So again, your past as well as your current behavior is going to affect this. And the third component of the social cognitive theory is the environmental factors. So now we're talking about um, the physical, social, and cultural environment around your clients. So by physical environment, I'm talking, do they live in a city or do they live in an urban area? Do they live in a place with good uh, public transportation or do they have to drive or walk themselves to get to wherever it is they need to get to, maybe to the the gym or something else. Um, so those are going to be uh, aspects of their lives that can either make it easier to exercise or actually create barriers to exercise that you're going to have to figure out a way around. Um, the social side of things, so think... Um, whether or not they have a good social network. Um, so does their spouse support them in the behavioral change they're trying to uh, create? Or do they maybe enable the old behaviors? Um, it, do they have friends who exercise if that's what they're trying to do is exercise? Um, do they, uh, are they kind of a loner? Do they not really have a social network? And you might need to uh, get them into maybe like a group fitness class so they can meet people and get a more social environment out of exercise that's going to be something that's going to bring them back to exercise every um, every exercise session um, and then the cultural so there are cultures around the world where physical activity uh, is downplayed a little bit or even something that is uh, uh, discouraged so especially for women there are a lot of cultures out there where um, women are not uh, encouraged to be physically active and so culture can have a big factor in this and even in a place like the United States where the culture doesn't quite fit that um, uh, that situation that I just described there are still cultural barriers to exercise that you might have to get past um, you know some people don't like to sweat because they're embarrassed of um, what they might look like or this there's their body odor or something like that and those are all cultural situations or cultural norms 
forms that you might have to help them get past in order to get them to exercise. All right, so these three factors, so again, personal, behavioral, and environmental factors, together are the social cognitive theory, and these three factors are going to determine what's called their self-efficacy for exercise. All right, so self-efficacy is basically the confidence in their own ability to change, um, and again, we're talking mostly about exercise here, so their confidence in their ability to uh, start an exercise program and stick to it. All right, so somebody that has very poor self-efficacy is probably not going to even take the initiation to start exercise, or somebody who has very good self-efficacy not only is going to start exercise, but they're probably going to stick to exercise. So their, uh, their ability or what they perceive as their own ability has a huge impact on their ability to actually change their behaviors. All right, so the next model I want to talk about is the health belief model. And for this, it's basically uh, two things here. So uh, does the person believe that they will get a disease if they don't change their behavior? And do they believe that that disease is something that's worth avoiding? All right, so for instance, uh, let's say somebody don't, doesn't think that smoking is going to hurt them long term. They don't think they're going to get you know lung cancer or some other kind of cancer or whatever it is, COPD. They don't think it's going to happen to them. All right, so in that situation, they're probably unlikely to quit smoking because they j just don't see it as something that's going to have a negative result in the end. Now, of course, that's not true for uh, a lot of people. A lot of people do get negative consequences to smoking eventually, but some people might not see that as a likelihood, so you need to maybe educate them a little bit. Now, the other side of this, so do they, disease, do they believe that the disease is something that is worth avoiding? So um, if you think about something like obesity, um, most of the adult population in the, in the United States is either overweight or obese. And so a lot of people have um, the, this belief that obesity uh, or at least overweight is sort of a norm and um, that it's not something that needs to be avoided. Now, I'm not saying to uh, fat shame. That's definitely not what I'm talking about here. That's that's not right. That's wrong. You shouldn't do that. However, educating people in the negative health consequences of uh, overweight and obesity is something that you as an exercise uh, scientist are going to have to do. Um, at, from time to time. So people know that there are uh, negative health consequences, but they might not know the severity of some of those negative health conf consequences. So they might not know how much obesity leads to things like diabetes and how diabetes can lead to, uh, uh, you know, besides things like death, uh, obviously, it can lead to things like amputations. It can lead to um, a loss of sensation in their, their fingers. It can lead to blindness. It can lead, lead to lots of things they don't want. And that's just one one potential consequence of obesity. There are other consequences. Obviously, things like heart attacks and strokes are major consequences, but those are more conse the consequences that people are a little more aware of. So again, the health belief model here is, do they think they're going to get the disease if they don't change their behavior? And number two, do they think that the disease is something that's worth avoiding in the first place? And if they don't believe both of these are, if they don't answer yes to both of those, then it's unlikely they're going to change their behavior in a way that's going to be more healthful because, again, they just don't think it's going to impact them. The next theory here is the self-determination theory of uh, for behavioral change, and this is all about motivation. So basically, everybody exists on this spectrum here where they're either amotivated, which means they're not motivated at all, or the other end of the spectrum, they're intrinsically motiv motivated, which means they themselves see the value in the change they uh, that they need to make, and they want to make it themselves. They are they are pushing themselves towards that change. And then in the middle, um, somewhere is an extrinsically motivated, which unlike intrinsically motivated when they're telling themselves they, they want to change and need to change, and extrinsically motivated is when somebody else is telling them they need to change. So for instance, if you were to tell somebody who doesn't think they need to exercise that they should, you are trying to give them extrinsic motivation to change. Um, will it work? Maybe, maybe not. Um, 
typically somebody who is intrinsically motivated is going to change a lot quicker and a lot uh, with a lot more success than somebody who's extrinsically motivated. And then somebody who's amotivated is probably not going to change at all. Um, so uh, other ways that people can be extrinsically motivated would be um, you know, praise of other praise from others. So you know if somebody starts telling you you look good, that makes somebody uh, feel better about themselves, and so that's a form of extrinsic motivation. Uh, for some people, they want to improve certain values, you know, their sort of health scores, you know, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, whatever, um, so they can get things like cheaper life insurance. Um, so that's again an extrinsic motivator. There's something outside of them in their in their own psychology that's making them want to change something, but it's not that they want to change just to make the change and for the uh, sort of the positive factors it's going to have on their own life. It's just for some sort of external sort of uh, loose connection with exercise. Um, so another version of this would be, you know, a coach or a teammate who's telling, you know, for an athlete maybe, uh, telling them to work harder, to do this, to do that. That's extrinsic motivation. Probably one of the most common forms of extrinsic motivation um, for older uh, married couples is going to be their spouse. All right, so um, and, and it doesn't have to be a married couple or an older couple for that matter, but oftentimes it is the spouse who is telling the person, you know, you you're going to uh, you're getting a little overweight. Maybe you need to reduce your weight a little bit. Maybe you need to exercise a little bit, eat a little bit better. Uh, you're you know we want you around for the grandkids or whatever it is that they're telling them. Um, you know that's a form of extrinsic motivation because it's not them saying to themselves I need to change so I can be around for my grandkids it's their spouse saying you need to change so you can be around for our grandkids so it's it's a little different so you can see how the motivation is coming from an external source not from an internal source so again though a motivated means you're not motivated at all you're probably not going to change extrinsically motivated means somebody else is trying to get you to change and you may change but the chances are you're probably not going to stick with it and then intrinsically motivated is somebody who is um, wanting to do it for themselves and not for anybody else or not from something somebody's going to give them and so those those people who are intrinsically motivated are most likely to actually change and so you can help somebody change along this spectrum um, through uh, a proper uh, education on the topic you know telling them the benefits that they can get from exercise or from eating properly or stopping smoking or whatever it is that you're trying to get them to change um, you know you can educate them on it you can try to make it easier for them in different ways by you know helping them find those barriers to change and helping them find ways around it or over them um, and so you can do a lot to push them in the direction of intrinsic motivation however somebody's not going to uh, simply go in that direction because you force them to again that's more of an intrinsic motivate or an extrinsic motivation and it sometimes works but oftentimes doesn't this course is largely geared towards the ACSM, so the American College of Sports Medicine, and a lot of what they um, sort of preach to us, the exercise scientists who belong to that organization. And so um, I'm trying to hit on the different behavioral change theories that they focus most on, and that if you were to go maybe take a certification exam, like the Certified Exercise Physiologist exam, you're probably going to see these models that I'm talking about here. The trans-theoretical model of behavioral change, this is something the ACSM loves. I guarantee if you take uh, one of their uh, higher level exams for certification, you're probably going to see multiple questions about this. All right, so. Basically, this is the idea that change doesn't happen all at once. It's something that is a dynamic process and it evolves over time. So uh, basically what it is, is you have these five stages of the change in whatever cha uh, stage you're in right now, your goal, so whatever your client is in right now, your goal is to get your client not all the way to the end to uh, changing their behavior, but just to kind of nudge them in uh, closer to the next stage. And you just keep nudging them along, hoping that they will go to the next stage and then the next stage and then the next stage until eventually they get to the last stage where they actually um, go and change their behavior and uh, adopt something that's going to last a lifetime. The five stages of change in the trans-theoretical behavioral model for behavior change is pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. 
So when I'm going over these different stages of change here, you're gonna see the number six month, well, you're gonna see six months come up a lot. A lot of these different stages have some six month period of time that's associated with them. Um, so just, if you're trying to remember, you know, how long is it between this and this, probably six months. Okay, so anyways. Pre-contemplation is the first stage of behavioral change, uh, and this is essentially people who um, they don't see themselves changing, they don't see the need for change, they're at least six months away from even trying to plan for a change. Um, so again, there's a, your six months. Most of this I'm going to be talking about exercise because that's kind of the point of this class. But So we're talking about behavioral change to get somebody from sedentary to exercising regularly. So. If you are in pre-contemplation, you're not planning to start an exercise program anytime within the next six months, essentially. All right, so again, they're not even considering it. They don't think they need to do it. They don't want to do it. They have no desire for it. That's pre-contemplation. Contemplation is the next stage here. And basically here, you have somebody who is thinking about change. They think that they might want to change sometime in the next six months or so. So again, there's your six month time period. Um, so they, they know they should change. They know they want to maybe change eventually. Um, they think, you know, a couple months from now, let's go ahead and get started here. You know, your, your New Year's resolution that's a couple months away. So maybe it's, you know, November and you're like, uh, you know, January first comes around, I'm going to um, start to exercise. And so again, you're within six months of when you think you're going to start your exercise program. Um, that is contemplation. The next stage is preparation. With preparation, you are now right before you're going to start change. So this is one of the few uh, stages here that is, oh, this is the only stage here that is not uh, a six month interval. So now you are within one month of starting that behavioral change, so starting to exercise. So again, preparation is within one month of the actual change uh, to uh, being active or stopping smoking or eating better or whatever it is. Um, and so during the preparation phase is where all the preparation happens. So this is where you're going to sign up for gym membership. This is when you're going to maybe buy that piece of exercise equipment that you've been thinking about buying. Um, this is when um, you're going to start looking into um, different uh, smoking cessation medications and patches and gums and those sorts of things. So again, this is when you're going to actively seek out information. You're going to start to sign up for things. You're going to pay for things. You're going to order things. You're going to you know interview personal trainers, whatever it is that you need to do in order to make that that behavioral change happen. That's going to happen in this one month period, um, which is again the preparation stage. All right. The next stage is the action stage, and this is the first six months after you start your behavioral change. So again, talking about exercise here, this is, so you were sedentary for a long time, You the day you start exercising begins your action stage. All right, so uh, all the way from the start of your action, or the start of exercise, till so six months later, you are in the action stage. Um, Action means you've you've done the behavioral change, you've initiated it. You know, if we're talking about exercise, you're now exercising. You know, three to five days per week of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise, um, and you're you're doing what you said you were going to do um, during your preparation, your contemplation phase. The last stage of behavioral change here is the maintenance stage. And the maintenance stage is when you have been exercising for at least six months, and now um, the chances of you quitting is going to drop off significantly. So during the action stage, that first six months where you're exercising, um, chances of quitting is pretty high. Most people who are going to quit are going to quit in that first six months. That's why it's a stage all by itself. Where the maintenance phase, so after six months, um, from that point on, the likelihood of quitting drops significantly. And it's going to drop more and more as time goes on. But again, after the first six months, most likely the person's going to stick with it for at least a, a fairly extended period of time. They might not do it forever, but they'll probably stick with it for a year or two years, something like that. Typically, they're going to stick with it until um, some sort of lifestyle change happens that um, maybe wasn't expected and kind of throws them through a loop and they relapse essentially and they have to start all over again. But 
Again, the five stages were pre-contemplation, meaning you don't think you need to have that, you don't need exercise or don't need whatever. Contemplation, you know you need to exercise, you think maybe you should be doing it sometime soon, but you haven't really started planning for it. Preparation is when you start to plan for it in that last month, um, right before the action phase, which is when you start the exercise program. Action phase is that full first six months of exercise, and then you go into the maintenance phase where it, it becomes much less likely that you're going to relapse and stop your exercise. Each stage of the trans-theoretical model for behavioral change has specific strategies that you should be trying to implement in order to get the person from the stage they're in down to the next stage and then to the next stage and to the next stage. So the idea behind this model is identify the stage they're in and only target them in ways that's going to work on that particular stage and get them to the next stage. Again, you're not trying to jump from pre-contemplation all the way to action. All right, So you, you can't do that. It's probably not going to be effective. You're going from pre-contemplation to contemplation and then from contemplation to preparation. Uh, so again, focus on one stage at a time, get them to the next stage. So some examples here of interventional strategies per stage. So in the pre-contemplation stage, this is where you want to do things like uh, clarify some misconceptions. So somebody might come to you and think, oh, well, you know, exercise is really dangerous. It's something that, um, you know, people die of heart attacks all the time with exercise. And I'm kind of overweight, you know, so-and-so, you know, my grandfather and my father had heart disease, whatever it is. Um, so maybe, I, maybe I, it's not right for me. Um, and so you hear that and then you have to try to uh, change that misconception and educate them a little bit. Teach them uh, the truth, which is that most people, as long as you don't have any sort of established disease or signs or symptoms of disease, the chance of you having a cardiovascular event like a heart attack or stroke during exercise is very, very low, especially if the exercise uh, plan was planned appropriately and the appropriate level of intensity was chosen. Um, some other things in the pre-contemplation phase, so maybe do some free health risk appraisals. So this is where you, you know people go to... Um, you know, put up a table at some clinic or uh, some sort of health festival or whatever it is, um, wellness festival, and you do, you know, free blood pressure screenings or free uh, cholesterol panels or something like that. And you just try to uh, educate people on their risk level so they understand, well, maybe I have something that I need to change in order to fix this risk that you told me I have that I didn't know about ahead. You know, it can be as simple as getting their height and weight and calculating BMI and telling them um, that, you know, your BMI is 29. That's in the overweight category and that carries with it a lot of risk. All of this is based basically about trying to get information out there. Um, it doesn't all have to be targeted. It can be mass media campaigns, you know, uh, advertisements uh, on billboards if you, and, you know, if you have the money to do that, or if you're in, you know, a worksite wellness area, you know, you're working for a corporation trying to improve the health of the, the people in that corporation, maybe putting up some, um, bulletin boards or flyers around the uh, the office so people understand uh, you're, you're starting a new exercise program and you know in January for people wanting to do their New Year's resolution why don't you come talk to us and check it out you know those are the kind of things that you would do during the pre-contemplation phase again it's a lot of educating correcting misconceptions and just sort of basically marketing um, the contemplation phase um, now again they they think they want to start exercising in the next six months or so but they don't really have a plan they're not preparing for it in any way all right so more marketing more education um, talk to them about their environment talk to them about why exercise is good give some guidelines to exercise um, tell them you know uh, about, uh, you know, the, there's this nice gym right down the street. It'd be very easy for you to get to, so it's not going to be difficult to get to the gym. So try to lower some of the barriers to exercise for them. You know, be a positive role model here. So uh, show them, um, uh, we'll tell them about your personal experiences. Maybe you used to be overweight yourself and through exercise you've lost the weight and you feel better, you have more energy. You know, maybe you used to get headaches all the time. Now you don't get headaches anymore. Um, 
you know, talk about those things, encourage people, uh, try to m- motivate them. So that's really what you're trying to do. Um, identify their social support um, networks. So uh, again, if you're in like a worksite wellness situation, maybe say, oh, you know, your friend uh, over in accounting comes every day on their lunch break. So maybe you can come with them and uh, you guys can exercise together. Um, whatever it is, try to um, push them to the next level, which is the preparation stage. All right, so for the preparation stage, again, they are going to start exercising. They're within about a month of starting exercise. They're starting to um, you know, sign up for gym memberships, maybe meeting with a personal trainer. They're setting up goals, which is a, a good intervention at this stage. So you can develop things like behavioral contracts, which is basically when they say, here's this thing I, I need to stop doing. Maybe I need to stop smoking. Um, and you just literally write it down on a piece of paper, um, what they're going to do, why they're doing it and um, you know what their motivation is for so you kind of remind them what it is they're doing it for um, you know whether it's to be there for their kids when they're when they're old or to be able to walk up the steps without getting out of breath whatever um, and you write it all down and you have them actually sign it it just gives them something concrete some physical object that they can look at and be reminded of that commitment to actually changing um, you can teach them time management skills. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, I just don't have the time for exercise. Um, so you can start to, again, you need to find these barriers and try to work around the barriers and lower the the uh, threshold for getting past those barriers. Um, so you can tell them, you know, you don't need to exercise 30 minutes all at once. You don't need to come here after work and waste 30 minutes of your time all at once. You can exercise 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes on your lunch break, and 10 minutes um, after work. So that can be as simple as walking to and from your car after work and then just going for a 10 minute walk during your lunch break. There's 30 minutes right there. Not a lot of time commitment because it's not one big chunk. So again, try to help them figure out how they can work it into their um, everyday lives. So during the preparation stage, this is when you want to do your fitness assessments. You want to find out what their, their you know, their body fat percentage is. Find out what their estimated VO2 max is. Find out all those things. You know how you know what's their one RM, so one repetition maximum. If they want to, you know, do some resistance training type of stuff. So do all your tests. Do all your health screenings. Do your exercise prescription. Do all that kind of stuff during the preparation phase. Um, so which is basically um, most of what we're talking about in this class during the action phase again this is just when they start exercising so here you're going to uh, continue to try to push them to come in to exercise every you know every two days or every three days whatever is part of the exercise prescription that you help write with them Um, set up some um, stimulus control so let's say if you if every time they get home by the time they get home and sit down they're just too tired to do anything then get them to take the long way home from work so they drive by the gym and they stop at the gym and they work out and then they go home or if you're trying to get them to lose weight and you know they're not going to eat junk food if they don't have it in the house, so you can just try to convince them not to buy the junk food in the first place. Um, So uh, continue to identify their social support networks and get them to utilize them to the fullest so that they can um, have external motivation as well as their intrinsic motivation to help them uh, continue with the exercise. Um, Teach them about relapse, you know, basically stopping exercise, you know, uh, and getting right back to it. So a lot of times somebody will miss one workout because something happened, you know, maybe they get a flat tire on the way to the gym and things just don't work out. They'd, and they, they just can't get there that day, whatever things happen, right? So, you know, a kid gets sick, whatever. Um, Teach them that that's okay. You can miss a workout and get right back into it. You know, a a short-term relapse doesn't necessarily mean you fall all the way off the wagon. It just means you had a bad day, something happened, whatever. Okay, you miss one day, come back again, you know, on Wednesday and we start back up. Right, so you need to make it okay to have little slip-ups so that when they have a little slip-up that they don't just stop altogether. All right, and then the last phase here, again, the maintenance phase, this is when um, they're probably not going to stop exercising, but you need to uh, find ways to keep them motivated anyways, because if it gets stale, if it gets boring, and you know, maybe they reach their goals, and then they decide, okay, I can stop now, I, I got to what I wanted, um, but exercise 
like any behavioral change doesn't work that way. You can't just stop. This is something that is a lifelong behavioral change. It should be at least. So, you know, review their goals, revise their goals if necessary, introduce some additional forms of training, you know, throw some variety into the routine, um, redo the fitness test so they can see how well they did with what uh, the exercise they've done over the last, you know, six months or so, and uh, use that again to help set new goals so that they have something to look forward to six months further into the future. And you just keep doing that indefinitely. Hopefully they'll stick with it um, for the rest of their lives. And hopefully you'll have a client that's going to stay with you for a long time. A lot of times uh, you're looking for new clients. Um, so basically you're looking for those people in the, the contemplation or even pre-contemplation phases. And so you need to just get yourself out there. So doing different mass media uh, campaigns. So putting together educational pamphlets with your information, uh, you know, putting it in a supermarket, putting it in, you know, a local community center, whatever it is. Um, Giving out free gym passes is another good one. So if you want to just get somebody in the door, once somebody's in the door, it's usually a little easier to sort of, you know, upsell them to uh, to sign up for a one month pass or sign up for personal training, whatever it is. If they're not in the door, it's very hard because you don't get to really talk to them then. Um, uh, create fun runs or go to fun runs like 5Ks that already exist and just try to recruit people um, into your gym or into your personal training business. And also go to your wellness fairs and your health fairs and you know do the free risk appraisals for people. Uh, try to meet people, try to talk to people, try to tell them about you and what you do and how you can hopefully help them become a better version of themselves. So these are the kind of things, these sort of mass media uh, campaign type things that are, is going to help you get yourself out there, hopefully get you some clients, get some business into your facility, and it's going to um, help your bottom dollar while at the same time allowing you to help a lot of other people improve their lives. A few things I've already mentioned, but I just want to talk about in a little bit more detail here. Um, Clarifying expectations. All right, so in other words, uh, we, we talked a little bit about changing misconceptions, but clarifying expectations it kind of goes along with that and it's super important. So uh, somebody comes to you and says, you know, it, it's maybe February or March, and they say, I want to, you know, have this amazing beach body come, you know, May or June so they can go on vacation. Um, but they're currently, you know, 50 pounds overweight. And you need to clarify their expectations a little bit and let them know that's not really a realistic um, behavioral, or that's not a realistic health goal, um, that it's not an outcome that is should be expected in such a short period of time, at least not in a healthful way. And so, with that, you just kind of restructure it a little bit. You tell them what isn't likely to occur and what might be a better goal, something that's a little more likely to be achieved. And this is when you'd want to um, do your smart goals with them. And uh, there's a video I've already created and uploaded on that. So if you don't know what I mean by smart goals, it's a it's a system for setting goals. Go watch that video; it'll help you understand this better. But use the smart goal model in order to uh, create goals for that client and try to get them into um, a more healthy the uh, relationship with exercise so they're more likely to be satisfied by their exercise program. And again, I already talked a little bit about barriers to exercise, but there's barriers that are personal barriers, physical barriers, interpersonal barriers, and environmental barriers. You need to try to find all those that you can, uh, not to necessarily have them think about all these terrible things that are stopping them from exercise, but so you can show them or talk to them about ways that they can get past that barrier. So, you know, a personal barrier may be their anxiety towards getting into the, into the gym and, you know, working out in this place where there's all these, you know, meatheads and whatever around that, that makes them very uncomfortable um, so you just say okay well we're, I'm gonna have you come in a different time of the day where there's not so much of that you know, you know maybe it, come in with a 6 a.m. crowd which is usually uh, usually a little older crowd a lot of times you know the poor work crowd um, they're not the meatheads typically um, and we can teach you how to use the equipment we can teach you how to uh, exercise appropriately so that when you decide to come after work on a Wednesday night, you don't feel so self-conscious. Um, 
Again, that's just one potential personal barrier. There's lots of other ones. Uh, physical barriers, you know, again, what's your transportation like to the gym? So maybe you don't have transportation to the gym, so you need at-home uh, exercises. So then fine, you just find at-home exercises. You write a plan with them um, that they can do at home with minimal equipment. Um, that, you know, that's a workaround for that. So um, interpersonal uh uh, barrier. So think about, you know, again, maybe their spouse isn't somebody that supports them exercising. Maybe their spouse hates exercise and thinks it's a waste of time and they shouldn't be doing it. Um, so maybe that's a good time to ask them to maybe bring their spouse in and you guys can talk about exercise and the benefits together. And maybe you can even convince that spouse to move to the next stage of behavioral change and at the very least be more accepting of your client and their desire to start exercising. And if you're really lucky, you can maybe convince their spouse to do it with them. And now a negative relationship about exercise turned into a positive one environmental barrier. So uh, maybe somebody lives in a neighborhood where they don't really feel safe walking at night. So again, you maybe convince them to come early in the morning before they go to work, um, or you maybe uh, show them where there is a gym near their work so they can go on their lunch break. You know, that's just one example of an environmental barrier. There's uh, several barriers that fit into each of these categories. I just gave one example of each. Um, but you can see how this, these kind of conversations need to go. All right, so um, the main thing that you really want to do in order to increase the likelihood of somebody initiating behavioral change is to try to increase their self-efficacy. So again, self-efficacy is that belief that they can do it, that they can change, and they can, they can stick to it long term. Term. Um, so you need to increase their self-efficacy so that they will actually take those steps necessary to start exercise and to keep exercising. A lot of times people, um, they know they probably should exercise or they um, know they should probably stop smoking, but they really, you know, they don't really like exercise or they actually really enjoy smoking, want to keep smoking. And so sometimes you need to help them with some decision balance, right? So they, you need to weigh the pros and cons. So literally listing out pros and cons to each side of things. Um, and hopefully you can help them come up with enough pros and cons that tip things in the direction towards the proper behavioral change that it's going to improve their health. So oftentimes when you're working with a new client, this means they've already gotten past several of the stages of change and they're probably in the preparation stage of change. So they've already come in, they've already, they're meeting with a personal trainer or whatever it is that you do um, or are going to do and um, they know they want change, they know they need change, they're motivated to do it, they're already buying things, paying for things, going places. All right, so then what do you do? So this is a list of sort of a step-by-step -step list of what I recommend you do. So number one, again, identify the problems related to the behavioral uh, behavior that needs change. So talk about their past attempts to change. So maybe they've joined other gyms in the past and it just didn't work out. They didn't stick with it. So you ask them, okay, what is it about that other gym that you didn't like that made you decide not to stick with it? And you try to figure out ways of getting around that barrier so that they can see how your gym or you're working with you might be different this time and they'll be more likely to stick with it and also to you know be your client. Um, the next step here would be setting their SMARTS goals. So make sure that the goals are specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and self-determined. All right, so in other words, they pick their goals. These are, this is what the acronym SMARTS stands for. So again, go watch that other video on SMARTS goals if you don't understand what I'm talking about there, and it'll help you to appropriately set goals for your new clients. Number three here, plan for and initiate the plan that you create that's going to actually lead to a lifelong behavior change. So in other words, write it out, script it out, have both of you on the same page so you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then actually just set a date. Say, okay, we're starting this Monday and have them start it. So number three is basically write the plan and then start the plan. Number four here is self-monitoring. So it's great if they're working with you and you can help show them their progress and the, track their changes over time, but most likely the, the, your client's not going to pay for your services every single time they want to exercise. 
they need to have some way of tracking their exercise on their own. All right, so if they don't track their exercise, it's hard for you as their um, trainer to know exactly what it is they're doing and not doing when you're not around. Um, and it's also something, uh, self-monitoring is also going to help them stay motivated because they have this, this ritual where they write down what they did and if they don't write it down, it's going to weigh on them mentally a little bit and sort of tell them, okay, maybe I really should just go to the gym and get it over with. And so there will be some days where they will exercise where they wouldn't have just because they have that notebook or that calendar or that fitness uh, tracking app that is sort of there in the background uh, as proof that they didn't follow through with what they agreed to do with uh, you and uh, with their new behavioral change. Number five here, reinforce and prevent relapse. Um, so again, remember they need to know that uh, it's okay to relapse. So uh, skipping down to the bottom here, um, discuss relapse ahead of time with them. Tell them there are going to be days where you're not going to follow through and that's okay. We just want to minimize those days all right? so that they know if they don't do what you ask them to do, you're not going to quit working with them. You're not going to belittle them. You're not going to um, make them feel bad about themselves. You're going to motivate them to come back and do it the next day. All right? So um, relapse is a part of change. It just is. All right? People are going to relapse, which when we're talking about exercise, that means skipping a workout, um, you know, overeating for a weekend or whatever it is. All right, so, but some other things that come in under this number five here, again, identify their social network, have maybe actually have a buddy system where they exercise with a, a friend, a coworker, a spouse, whatever it is, um, help them become self-motivated and self-accountable. So again, the, the notebooks helps there, but um, just teach them um, strategies or teach them why exercise is good and tell them, you know, if they do this, they can expect this for their lives. And if you're not doing this, then you should expect a continuation of what you've had and you, you obviously came to us because you wanted to change that you don't like what you had and you, know, you don't like the fact that maybe you're overweight or maybe your blood pressure is too high or you're you know diabetic and you want to try to lower your need for you know exogenous insulin doses whatever it is you want to try to increase that self-motivation you want to define and talk about high-risk situations so maybe somebody who needs to lose a little bit of weight they know every time they you know go to a a sports bar with their friends to watch a big game or whatever it is that they tend to you know drink eight beers and have a giant plate of nachos all to themselves and so talk about these high risk situations and help them come up with a plan that's going to help them go to these places that they like and hang out with their friends without necessarily having all the calories or the negative side to that so maybe um, have them switch from some heavy full calorie beer to some light beer Beer, or maybe have them switch from nachos to uh, some sort of you know vegetable dish, or um, maybe going from the big platter of nachos to a little side order of nachos, whatever it is. So help them find ways to still do what they love, but but minimize the negative side effects of that. Develop coping strategies. So I've already talked about relapse and understanding relapse happens, um, but you can also revise goals as things change. So sometimes somebody gets you. Know, you know, three quarters of the way through a period of time that it was set for their smart goal and they realize it's just not going to happen and rather than make them um, lose their motivation and feel miserable about themselves for the last month of their smart goal you're probably better off just recognizing okay clearly it's not going to happen within our the period of time that we allotted um, let's revise the goal to something that's still possible or let's just restart from here and have the goals go out further to another time point and let's just, let's just go back at it again. Also make sure exercise needs to be fun for most people. If it's not fun, it's not enjoyable in some way, they're probably not going to stick with it. And so that means finding the proper exercise for them. So maybe they hate the treadmill but like the bike, hate the bike but love to swim then they should be doing whatever it is they enjoy rather than doing whatever it is you prescribe for them. And then number six here, reassess and reevaluate the exercise um, after a period of time to see how it did, see if it needs to be tweaked in some way, see how you can reset goals so that they will continue to exercise for another period of time. 
So as the exercise professional, it's super important that you are a good and effective communicator with your clients. So that means uh, giving clear uh, instructions, clear guidance, concrete examples, concrete goals, things where it's very specific. Um, you need to be an effective listener to those. So you need to show empathy when they tell you something that is upsetting to them or that they think uh, you know, is a, a, an issue in their lives. Um, that doesn't mean to be their therapist, but it does mean to show some uh, concern and you know, sort of be a little bit of a friend for them. Um, give them respect. Don't belittle them. Don't make them feel uh, that they aren't uh, doing good or that they uh, don't deserve your respect for some reason because maybe they're less fit than you or of course they're less fit than you. Um, this is what you do for a living or they have a nine to five job and they come to you after the job. So you know, understand that and just again, make sure that they feel respected. Be genuine. So don't put on a big fake smile and a big fake uh, you know, laugh or whatever is be yourself. Try to be personable. Try to be in enthusiastic you know i'm not saying to go in there and be tired and low energy all the time and i know sometimes that's going to happen but um, go in and try to be as genuine as you can and so let them get to know you a little bit and get to know them a little bit and have it be more of a sort of a friendly working environment minimize what's called confrontational correction. So if you've ever seen um, a show like Dr. Phil or one of the other shows where people get on TV and they're screaming in somebody's face and saying, why are you doing this? Of course you shouldn't be doing this. This is terrible for you. It's terrible for your family. It's terrible for everything. You're a terrible person. No, that's it's really inappropriate and it really isn't a, a good way of getting somebody motivated. People don't like to be belittled when you're motivated them, motivating them. They, they like to be encouraged. So um, encouragement means um, being, again, empathetic, being respectful. Uh, and if you absolutely need to be very blunt with somebody, make sure it's somebody that you've been working with for a while that you have a good relationship with and only use it very, very sparingly. Sometimes people need to understand that no, 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 what you just said is not right, and you definitely should uh, rethink that. And it's okay to be a little blunt, but try to be as nice about it as you can, and then go right back to a more effective, empathetic way of communicating. Also, you're going to probably have to do some cognitive restructuring. So this is basically taking um, your client's negative statements about themselves or about exercise, about their ability to exercise, and trying to turn it on to uh, turn on itself into a positive statement um, and so it just brings a little light to the conversation it, and changes the mood and makes it more likely that your client's going to be motivated for that that specific exercise session as well as to stick with it over time some examples of cognitive restructuring here, um, you have the negative statements in, the, in a positive version of that statement. You're going to see that I, I do twist them quite a bit and that's what you're going to have to do. So maybe somebody comes to you and says, I'm never going to get in shape. Um, so then you need to change that a little bit. It doesn't mean to lie to them, but change it. So say, you know, change takes time. Uh, you didn't get out of shape. Uh, overnight, and so you're not going to get into shape overnight. You know, um, and let them know that yes, it's it's a long journey ahead, but it's a journey they can do. All right, so that's the idea here. Um, here, the next one, I'm fatter than everyone else in my class. Uh, right, so they come in, they're very down on themselves, and whether or not that's true, it's probably not. Um, but regardless, um, you need to restructure it in such a way where it becomes. Uh, less negative at least, um, but hopefully something that's a little more positive. So maybe you can say, you know, everyone has somewhere to, uh, that they start at. You know, everybody has their own starting line. Um, and so other people who might um, be more like what you want to be, and they started before you. So they're just further along than you, but they were probably with where you were at one point in time. Um, and they've worked very hard to get where they are now. And you're going to do the same thing and you'll get there eventually. So you see, it's just a different way of thinking. Again, it's more more positive spin on things. So I'll let you read the last couple examples here on your own, but you can hopefully get the idea here. There's a lot of different uh, theories and models out there about behavioral change. We hit on the big ones that the ACSM loves, and I guarantee you're going to see on a certification exam if you take one through them. Um, but um, a couple other ones that you might see on their exams, but probably not nearly as much, would be the social ecological model and the hedonic theory. Um, I'm not going to talk about those here. They're in your textbooks, so go ahead and read your textbooks to learn a little 
little bit more about those um, and uh, hopefully you're able to get enough information on those to uh, maybe make some use of it but again the, the ones we've covered are the are really the big ones that I think you're going to use the most and what you're going to need for your certification exams and so on and so forth. Hopefully that was a nice overview of behavioral change theories and models for you. Again, it was pretty brief, um, so we didn't cover everything, but if you have any questions, you can put those in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you. Otherwise, please come back and watch another video. Thanks.